All week, we've met inspiring individuals in the Meet the Future You panel discussions, and today is no exception. Today's guests are all making a positive difference in our collective quest to tackle climate change. Get ready to ask plenty of questions using the Q&A box to the right of the screen, because these guys are raring to answer them. On the panel, we have Alvaro Rojas Zamora, an aerospace engineer from Rolls-Royce, Emma Ackley, a science communications manager for the Marine Stewardship Council, Celine Moriera, commercial testing coordinator for Polymateria, uh, Michael Kelly, power engineer consultant, Ricardo Energy and Environment, Ryan Hale, senior environment consultant, Ricardo Energy and Environment, Arusa Adisi, an in innovation engineer from Drax. And as ever, asking your questions, it's... Fayon Dixon! Thank you so much, Ade! <laughs> Great to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you. Oh, it's so good today, isn't it? Yes, awesome. Oh my gosh, let's get started. So, Meet the Future You, without a doubt, I think it's the best thing going because this is your opportunity to see people that are doing the jobs that you want in the future. And to be honest, the future, those kind of jobs, some of them you're going to go for don't actually exist yet, but it's still good to hear how you can get on the road to working in STEM. So, my fantastic panel, how are you all doing? Hi. Hello. 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 Yeah, I'm a waver. Hi, I'm a waver. <laughs> it's so good to see you all. Thank you so much for being part of Meet the Future You. So, um, we're going to crack on with some awesome questions. And the role of innovation engineer, now that is quite a role. I'm going to ask Arusa, Arissa, what exactly do you do? And also, how do you work with the environment through your job? So, yes, my, the title of my, my job is very interesting. So I get to look at new technologies, the new systems that we could potentially um, have here in the UK to reduce our um, CO2 that's in the environment. So I get to look at renewable energy systems, wind, solar, and seeing how we can make it happen and how we can decarbonize um, the UK's la energy landscape and get us to um, net zero. Absolutely sensational. So much work goes on behind the scenes. And there you are, right at the forefront. Fantastic. And thank you so much for your valuable work. I'm going to ask Ryan now. Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm not too bad. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. Now, if there is such a thing, Ryan, what does a typical day in your job as an environmental consultant look like? Well, I'm a uh, ecologist by trade, so that could be uh, aquatic or terrestrial ecology. So uh, a part of that is a lot of field work. So I get to go to some beautiful places up and down the country doing uh, habitat or uh, targeted species surveys. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits of being an ecologist is that it's just so diverse and really no day or week is the same. That's, um, that's one of the benefits of the job, really. Yeah, that diversity, never quite knowing what you're gonna, what's going to be put in front of you each day. That's what gets you up in the morning, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's what I got into. And they just say it's just exciting. And I think you're ever learning something new as well. I think it's a ever evolving uh, degree as well. So uh, you're always learning something new. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, I'm going to go to an old friend of mine now. Not picking any favourites, but Alvaro and I go way back. We've been doing Big Bang Fair, Meet the Future You for years, haven't we? Yes. Yes. Many, we're, many years. Yeah, it's been really good to see you. It really is. Now, you are an aerospace engineer, and I know you've worked on some really exciting projects, but please tell the young people out there, what are some of your favourites? Um, I think some of my favorites are, well, one, when you get to work with uh, new aircraft, like, for example, this one that I've got here. This is one of the aircraft that I work. It looks like a whale. Um, <laughs> but also, I, I work basically on the engines of the aircraft. So the new engines that we're doing, they're all, as, as the term that you've heard before, going towards that net zero goal. So it's all about how do we make these engines cleaner and, you know, uh, more friendly with the environment. So it's really cool to see and work with that new technology technology and see how we can make planes essentially cleaner. Gosh, what a job. <laughs> and what a favourite. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Celine, 
You work in biotransforming plastics. This is, we really want to hear about this because there is a, such a huge concern as to what is going on with plastics. So can you explain to us why there is, um, explain to us what these are and why they are so important with regards to the environment? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's pretty much a hot topic, plastic pollution, and it's pretty much what a lot of people are talking about. Governments are very concerned about this, especially land pollution, land plastic pollution going into the oceans and causing, everyone knows about the gyres and how big there's like an island of plastics in the ocean. So essentially, um, the, the company I work for is in order for us to stop the plastics from getting into the ocean, we need to target those plastics on land. So essentially fugitive plastics, plastics that end up getting littered. And what my company in the end did is it developed a additive that goes into the production of the plastics when they are made. So for example, a polypropylene container, a film, your, your packaging, your, your throwaway plastics, straws, cups, all of that. So the additive goes goes into that and then once if the plastic gets littered so if it goes to the recycling stream and everything that's fine but in the case it gets littered then with the sun and the humidity and the heat and all your environmental stimuli this activates the technology the additive within the plastic to basically start breaking down the molecules of the polyolefin your plastic into more um, smaller molecules to become bi compatible and essentially biodegrade in the natural environment so that's just a very small summary of it good grief i mean this <laughs> is what this is what we need to hear you listening to this lot you did you ever believe that you could be involved in such an incredible mission when you were younger this is changing the world yeah, not at all. It's it. I've been. I'm really fortunate, honestly, with the opportunity I've been given to work for a company like this. Um, but it's just. It just shows that if you really, if you really determine, and if you just go out there, you know, so many opportunities can come up of working in areas you never thought you could. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, I do talk a lot about communication and it is so, so important. You know, even when you're studying at school, they always say teamwork and communication is high up there. Now, I want to find out more about, because there's been a great question about science communication managing. So let's find out a little bit from Emma what that means and what exactly do you do to support the environment in your role? Hi, yes, um, my name's Emma Ackley and I work for the Marine Stewardship Council, which is an international non-profit organisation that aims to end fishing, uh, end overfishing, sorry, and um, also provide seafood for future generations. And so um, my role as science communications manager is making sure that all of our science is communicated really clearly. Um, so that could be helping to tell our stories better, so um, talking to fishers and writing stories on maybe how they've um, improved their fishing gear to reduce turtle bycatch, for example. Um, it could be working with media and journalists, websites, social media in lots of different forms. So whether it's writing or whether it is uh, doing presentations. That is so fantastic. And if you always wanted to work with animals, yeah, definitely. Um, so I started off studying zoology um, and then did a master's in wildlife um, conservation. Uh, I've always loved animals um, as a really young girl and um, it just made me the happiest just spending my time with animals. So I always wanted to to work in that. Um, and before working uh, for the Marine Stewardship Council, I worked for ZSL, um, which is the international organisation that runs at London Zoo. So I spent a lot of time looking at gorillas and all different animals while working at the zoo so um lots of great activities gosh you're living the dream aren't you <laughs> you're just doing exactly what you want that's fantastic really really great so you follow your passion it'll get you to the dream job michael thank you so much for being so patient i haven't forgotten about you <laughs> let's ask a little bit about the role that you do now as a power engineer consultant what's that all about 
Thanks so much. Yes, so I'm a power energy consultant at Ricardo, and basically we support the network operators in the UK with the transition towards a net zero economy. So you probably would have noticed that in the UK, the government has set a target to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And one of the ways to achieve that is to accommodate more low carbon technologies. So the next generation of children are going to see less gas boilers in the home and more uptake of electric heaters to heat the homes. They're going to see an end to driving petrol and diesel cars, which will see a big uptake in electric vehicles. All of that requires electricity from the grid. And currently the grid that powers our homes is not at the standards ready to accommodate these amount of technologies at a huge industrial scale. So a lot of my work is supporting a lot of the network operators who own the networks in the UK to try and come up with innovative solutions to support that transition to getting more electric vehicles and heat pumps on the network. Lots of challenges, but a very, very huge, hugely exciting opportunities to get involved in a lot of range of projects and using more electrical appliances that cuts down on our carbon footprints. Mm, and it's... It's more and more and more necessary. Every moment that we, you know, we spend here even talking about it now, it's just like we've just got to move as fast as we can and get everybody on board. So, again, what a fantastic job. And to be at the forefront of that, something that, again, will affect your future so much. So let me go to Alvaro now. We're looking at the future of planes. How are the future planes being made to be more sort of environmentally friendly and sustainable? So you've got, I think, one of the areas we're investigating more is, for example, electric planes. So, for example, in, in my company, we are looking to break the, you know, the, the, the record for speed on an electric aircraft. And that's like 300 miles an hour with our axle plane. Um, that's one of the ways we're doing. So that's the future, essentially. That is the electric planes in the future. But I'm also looking at how can we do that shorter term, right? With the engines we've got right now, can we, for example, use sustainable aviation fuel? So, for example, fuels that come from plants, for example, right? Or comes from uh, CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So you turn that into a fuel and then put it into the engine. So that way, your, your effect really is zero at the end of the day. Um, and we're also looking at, you know, the combustion that goes into the engine. How can we make that leaner? How can we make it to be essentially more effective and consume less of that fuel? So I think those are the three ways we're going, we're going towards that. This sounds incredible. An electric plane that can go at 300. Listen, that is blowing my mind. <laughs> That'll be ready in what, a year or so? Oh, no, no, no. The, the work record is coming in, you know, in a few months' time. <gasps> so the engine's already built and it's, and it's in Gloucester, I believe. Uh, and it's already taxiing and working and it's just set to break the record in a few months' time. Oh, my gosh. Anybody around the Gloucester area, hold on to your ears. <laughs> Amazing. Now, Arusa, can you give um, some advice to younger people who are looking to get into STEM careers? Oh, yeah, definitely. So I'd, I'd really recommend doing work experience. So if you read or you see any anything that's interesting to you, just write a letter and find out if you can spend half a day or a day with um, an engineer or a scientist working in that area to find out more about what they do. Um, even if you decide that you don't want to go into that specific area, maybe it'll spark something in your mind about where else you might want to pivot to. So I definitely recommend um, doing your research and just asking to see if you can um, find out more from other people. That is the best. Asking questions. Don't be afraid. And what I find as well, Arusha, and I wonder if you'll agree with me, when you ask people to share what it is that they do or give you tips and advice, they help you, don't they? They, they, they do. Definitely. People really like talking about, you know, what they do because um, they're passionate about it. So they want to share that information with you. So you should definitely use that. <laughs> don't be afraid to ask. Never be afraid to ask. So, um, Celine, is there actually a replacement for plastic that will break down more easily? Um, there are many alternatives to plastics. I think the question comes to in terms of um, the environmental footprint. So in terms also of what is more easily recyclable. And in the end, plastics 
the plastics is a very versatile material so it can be used for a lot of things and it's very cheap to produce as well so in the end it is there's a lot of beneficials to using plastics so the problem here comes to dealing with its waste um, if there's alternatives, there is definitely alternatives, and you, I think it's always good to have many types of different plast, um, products to use. But in the end, it's dealing with with the actual the waste of it and trying to find a way that you know we can minimise that and mitigate that by um, improving infrastructures in terms of waste man management and everything. Yeah, thank you. <sighs> A big task, but we're on it. We're working on it at least. Thank you. And to Michael, um, we're looking at net zero economy right now. How will our day-to-day -day lives change to support this? Oh, absolutely massive. So uh, people can do, can do a lot of things. So, for example, the UK is already on the path towards rapidly scaling up the, the uptake in renewable generation. So quite a lot of now of your energy that you're importing from the grid for electricity use is getting met by renewable forms of generation. So solar or wind turbines. But one of the big, big challenges at the moment in time is how do we reduce our carbon footprint in our homes uh, when we're in the transport sector? The, these are huge challenges that, that still need to be overcome by ourselves and the government needs to set uh, adequate policies to achieve that target towards net zero. So as I said, cutting, make, making buildings more energy efficient, so basically improving the overall insulation of buildings to make them more energy efficient, so we're using less heat because the heat is stored in the buildings, using uh, zero emissions point of use devices, so using heat pumps to heat your homes, and when you're going on the roads, uh, investing in electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. That is again really, really good news. Thank you so much. Now, with the bridge between school, uni, and then actually going into a job, it's very hard to know if what you're studying is actually going to help you in the future. So, Emma, can you tell me what did you study and how does it help you in your current job? Yeah, definitely. Um, I studied um, a BSc honours in zoology and then went on to do a master's in wildlife conservation. Um, and this really helps me every day because um, I need to be able to read scientific papers. I need to be able to translate some of that science into lay people speak so that um, people all around the world can understand, you know, our scientific outputs as well. Um, I think that analytical side as well of um, a science degree gives you is really useful for communications as well um, and all of the um, field work as well has really helped because I can understand the challenges that um, you know fishers face when they're out there every day trying to uh, you know harvest fish from the ocean and trying to also protect the environment at the same time and um, making improvements on their fishing gear for example so um, I would say there's there's lots of great things that I need for my job and actually it was a requirement um, actually for my job to have an, a, a first degree in science so yeah. And were you any good at science at school? Just throw that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this is really interesting, actually, because I was actually in, you know, the bottom sets for science when I was um, younger. Um, when I was doing GCSE, I was on the, the lower foundation paper. I think things have changed now. But what really helped me is um, I had um, top marks in one of the pieces of coursework that we did that was on anti, uh, anti whaling communities and all of that movement back in the 80s and 90s. And I was the only one that got an A star in the class. And so my science biology teacher pulled me inside and said, I think you should be doing the higher papers and so he sat down with me and made me reset my GCSE science and I came out with all A's so I had somebody believe in me at a young age and it it sort of paved the way for my for future career to do A-level biology and go on to do that and without him I wouldn't be here. That is absolutely amazing and it is that thing isn't it you only need one person to believe in you to get behind you and there's so many people out there to ask so I'm so glad you got onto the track that you wanted to be on. Now Alvaro we've had a question hot from a school in Cornwall I'm going to read it out word for word I don't want to miss anything it says they have a new space hub being built and made active right on their doorstep. Does Alvaro, have any tips about getting into a career in aerospace? Yes. 
So, um, one, I know about that space stuff. That's really, really cool. Um, so I would say, for me, it was not easy. Like, I didn't follow a straight route to get into Earth, but I knew I liked planes since I was little. Same thing that you might be able to do when you go to the space hub. I went to the airport when I was little. I knew I wanted planes. So I started going towards a career in, in aeronautical engineering, but it didn't, it didn't go straight. Like I, I changed universities. I went to mechanical engineering. I went to another country. Um, but in the end, I always had the idea that I wanted to be, be an aeronautical engineer. So don't worry if the path that you take is not straight. You can get there in the end. I would, I would have loved to have done an internship or an, or an apprenticeship. Uh, I didn't get the opportunity to do that because I didn't know they existed. I didn't have things like this that would tell me about it. So I would definitely look at doing some sort of apprenticeship, a work experience, uh, or an internship in an aerospace company uh, and start going through there and have, have the goal where you want to go. Okay, I want to, be, I want to work in, you know, in space, but don't worry if the path strays a bit. You, you, can, you can always get there. That's it. Have your target in mind and the meandering. You pick up skills along the way, don't you? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Ryan, what's the most exciting or rewarding project that you've been part of in the last year? I think one of the most rewarding ones was um, we were instructed with Welsh Water to, uh, they had identified several reservoirs uh, in the Welsh hills that were to be decommissioned. Um, some of those could have resulted in a loss of life if they weren't fit for purpose. Um, so us as ecologists went out to determine what habitats and what species were present uh, in order for those works to, to take place. Um, and I think when you, you, you don't necessarily think that you'd be working in something like that, which could ultimately protect human life, but ensuring that those surveys were carried out uh, and all the correct mitigation was in place uh, really was rewarding. And it kind of goes to show that, you know, as an ecologist, you're not just looking at the bugs and the insects, it's, it's thinking about the wider community as well. Ah, oh, fantastic. That's great stuff. And especially in the mad year that we've had, it's good that you still were able to do something so um, rewarding. Thank you. Now, you will spend more time at work than you will with your family when you get older, without a doubt. So you've got to go for something that you love. So I want to ask uh, Michael, what do you love most about your job? I like the fact my job is make, making a big difference. So every day when I'm going to work, I'm helping to, to take part in a lot of innovative projects that are going to make a big difference to the energy sector. So, for example, one of the projects that I was involved in was we sat down with a range of different bus operators in the West Midlands of the country and helped them try to establish the infrastructure that's required to allow them to effectively charge their buses and support the uptake of electric buses in the West Midlands area. And that project was a, was a success and we're now seeing major developments in electrifying buses in the area because they have access to charging points to charge the buses. That's one classic example of where the sort of work that I'm doing makes a big difference because it allows us to accelerate the uptake of more electrical appliances like electric buses in the UK and cut carbon emissions quite rapidly in that area. So just on a selfish point for me, my hometown is actually Coventry. I live in London now, but my hometown is Coventry. Are they going to be getting these uh, buses? At some point in the, in, in the next couple of years, Come on. You, 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 are, you are going to see a, a big uptick in a lot of EV chargers. So eventually you will see more electric buses and EVs in your area at some point. Wicked. That's so great. Mum, you're going to be going on an electric bus really soon. Oh, this is great news. Thank you. Really great news. So, um, Arisa, you are very inspirational yourself. But can I ask you, which other people in STEM have inspired you? Oh, wow, that's a great question. So um, I think that going back to my family, so I have two aunts who um, were engineers and just hearing about what they did really made me want to be an engineer. They had some really cool jobs. Like one of my aunts, she worked for um, the UN as an engineer. So when she told me about what she did, I definitely knew that I wanted to get into engineering. My mouth is dropped. I mean, you you hear about, you know, there's a few women in engineering, but you had them in your family. That's incredible. So you could literally see and touch and talk to people that were doing it. I could, I could yes. <laughs> I, I'm amazed. That's so fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Celine, 
I want to know, what is the most challenging part of your job? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the most challenging. I think, in my opinion, the challenging is we work with a lot of brands and a lot of customers that when it comes to the world of industry and when you have a when you have a brand, you have a specific, you know, you have a specific logo, a specific thing that makes your brand <clears throat> unique and everything. And when we talk about sustainability, in the end you have your fourth R of the three R's, which is redesign. So I guess the challenging part is talking to these big brands and telling them, you know, yes, this is part of your brand and this significant color, but the, the right thing to do is for our planet, you know, for you look around, you see how the planet is and, and the waste and the pollution that's been going on. And what in this case, it comes to your 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 morals and what is the right thing to do. And it's kind of play, not it's just having these tough discussions with them because obviously, you know, it, it's really complicated when it comes to someone changing the entire product. But in the end, you know, it's for a bigger cause. So I would say being part of those conversations can be very challenging and to be able to have to be very diplomatic and very um, calm and everything. I mean, better to be in a challenging conversation, to be on the outside and not being able to make any change at all. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Now, Alvaro, old friend, tell us about any projects that you've worked on that actually went wrong and what you learned from it. Well, I wouldn't say a project that went wrong. I would say that, so I work on experimental jet engines. So basically our job is to try to make the projects go wrong, right? So we try to make the engines basically cough or, you know, spit some flames or whatever. Essentially, they almost never do because that's our job. If we design them correctly, now when I get to test them, those things, you know, we tried for them not to happen. It's really cool when they do. So some of the things that, things that can uh, be a bit challenging to see is, for example, when we throw like a lot of ice or a lot of sand or even, you know, even birds, not, not live birds, obviously, uh, in, into the engine to see how it reacts. I think, you know, what we do is we examine then the engine. It's almost like a little bit of a detective work. So we strip it all to the very last components and lay them all out in lots and lots of tables, all the components. And you start to see them, take pictures, look at them with a microscope and see, okay, did this go as we expected? Uh, could we make it even better uh, that, than we could? So that's what we do. When we find a challenge of that sort that maybe, you know, maybe the engine didn't behave like we thought it was going to be, okay, how can we actually make it so that it actually works even better? than now. So it's a bit of like a detective work. Fantastic. So your job is just literally detecting if it's going wrong, you're doing your job right. <laughs> exactly. Love it. Emma, can I ask you what you love most about your job? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, I'm, I'm kind of a people's person for communications. You kind of have to be with some respect. And I just love um, meeting all the fishes and kind of seeing those stories play out on the ground. Um, all the NGOs that work with the fisheries as well. Um, I love hearing about the stories and being able to tell those stories and give those people a voice to show what they are doing to, to protect the oceans. So I would say uh, that's my favourite part because I get to meet with hundreds of people around Around the world students were funding research projects on from all around the world so um yeah i would say that cool cool i can't believe we've kind of ran out of time but i've got just got time for one more question it goes to ryan ryan in ecology do you directly work with animals we do, yeah. so um a lot of our work will be targeted uh, species surveys so as I said, that could go anything from tiny macroinverts in the river all the way up to badgers, bats and otters. Um, so it's a huge, diverse kind of range of species that, that we work with, um, each kind of having their own tailored survey that we have to do, um, each of them having their own kind of requirements of what habitat they want. Um, so, yeah, getting out there and doing either bird surveys or walking in the middle of the countryside looking for bats, it's a, 
not the worst job to get into. <laughs> Look at the smile on that face. You love your job, don't you? Oh, wow. It's just been so fantastic to speak to you all. Thank you all for giving your time today. I know our young people will really, really benefit from what they heard. You know, finding that person who believes in you, remembering to ask questions, going for what you love. I mean, come on. This could be you in a few years. So thank you all so much. It's lovely to see you. Oh, a day. Did yeah. you catch a little bit of that? Yeah, I did. It was a really interesting panel. I really enjoyed that. I also love the way that you managed to drop Coventry in there and drop your mother in there. Always. Wow. Always. Wow. Nice style. <laughs> Almost as stylish as that jacket you got on there, Fayon. I thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, well, thanks to our panel and thanks to the lovely Fayon, of course. And uh, if our panel have inspired you, don't forget to check out the Meet the Future You quiz in Big Bang Explore at mtfy.org.uk.